So there was a five grand bonus if you got to the end of your probation period. And after a few months, I said something about, oh, the five grand bonus. And she went, oh, I, I got that at the start. You know, what? How? I said, well, I just told them, sure, <laughs> if you don't like me, you'll just get rid of me. So just assume that I'm going to be staying and you're like, mm. Man, you know, I would like that five grand now. And the lesson of that was, if you don't ask, you don't get and always, always negotiating salary. Hello, and welcome back to Job Math, the podcast for only the most fabulous Gen Z professionals. I'm Dale. And I'm Lisa. This podcast is for you if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want. Don't forget to follow and subscribe on Spotify, on YouTube, on TikTok, and on Instagram. You can also find free resources on how to improve your career, for example, resume templates and guides, or tips on how to get a pay rise by visiting www, or even better, download the Career Badger mobile app for iPhone and chat live with Lisa, our resident career coach. So Lisa, what are we here to talk about today? Today, we are lifting the lid on careers in B2B sales. And who's our fabulous guest that we are talking to today? Our guest today is an enterprise sales leader who has worked for multiple blue chip software companies, as well as a number of startups and private equity backed scale ups. Someone who, as we like to say, has been there, seen it and done it all. So we are joined by our distinguished guest, Javon. Can you please introduce yourself? Hey there, guys. Uh, great to be here. I'm Siobhan Gallagher. I have at least 20 years of skin in the game, the sales game. I'm absolutely passionate about sales, managing global teams, helping people be the best they can be and also get the rewards for their efforts. I am very involved in the women in tech movement and in coaching and mentoring younger salespeople specifically women, if I can, to help them rise up through the ranks. And yeah, delighted to be here and share, share some of my hard-won knowledge. Maybe give us a little bit about a summary of your background, where you grew up, a little bit maybe about your education, and maybe like a potted work history as, as well. It'd be great. Sure. Uh, so <laughs> it can come as no surprise that I grew up in Belfast because in the X number of years since I left, I still have the accent. I grew up there and to be honest, I very quickly left because I grew up during troubles. I left, I came to London and I always wanted to work in a large, I didn't realize in those days that they were actually what enterprise businesses are. Um, but I always, when I was a kid, we would have the Sunday Times newspaper and I would always read the business section and read about these amazing places where people worked in sales and made big money and that was always my dream. I, my dad had his own business and that's really what drove me. He was a brilliant entrepreneur. Unfortunately his business was also bombed a few times because we were in Belfast. Um, he made and lost like quite a few fortunes. I always say that if he had been born in the US, he'd have given uh, Steve Jobs a run for his money. Mm. But he was, um, yeah, I really learned at the foot of the master, you know, um, Mick, Magic Mick. He knew what we'd sell. And he had a toy, toy warehouse. He would import toys uh, because obviously this was in the days where the internet didn't exist. Um, he would get the ferry across to Manchester in England and fill up a, a whole container load of toys and bring them back to Belfast and sell them. And um, yeah, that's that's my background. And I can give you a quick overview of my potted career history, if you like. I worked in media, selling print media. Then I sold radio advertising, which is an interesting concept because if you think about it, you're actually selling thinner. You know, how can you really uh, conceptual <laughs> the concept of radio advertising? And um, yeah, it didn't help that we didn't. I didn't work for a great uh, radio station. Dropping on <laughs> our sales, our listening figures were really bad. So <laughs> that was a challenge because that's the metric that which um, guides us to who will assign their advertising budget to you. So um, then we came up to the millennia. Uh, the millennium 
remember that. Well, actually, some of your your listeners may not remember that. So this Y2K buzz that's going around at the moment, that, that was serious. Like, we all thought that our computers would stop. Happening there. Lo and behold, as we started getting closer to the year two, people realized that the computers may not actually be set up to function past New Year's Eve, 19. And I mean, this was a really real, this was a concern in terms of national infrastructure. It was really a big fear as well that the lights would go out. Yeah, but it was also a brilliant uh, sales opportunity. Then I moved to work for Granada TV for a while. I sold digital advertising. At that point, it was called New Media. Um, <laughs> I hadn't really got, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure my age, obviously I was only three at the time. I loved it, you know, and I just, I love technology, even though I didn't learn any science or tech at school. Uh, because I went to Catholic grammar school and, you know, that was just way too advanced for the nuns. And the nuns really were like the nun and dairy girls. I, I got into tech. Um, it started, you know, tech started working its way into the workplace. And um, I, I sold a really brilliant um, legal desktop a- application that eventually moved to the cloud. And that got me really interested in, you know, the potential of tech and the story started coming out of Silicon Valley about um you know the the all of the tech companies that were de- being developed there and eventually that kind of reached the UK. I really taught myself everything well I taught myself a great deal about what I was selling and you know and that in those days uh, LinkedIn Learning didn't exist, Coursera didn't exist, all of the re- the resources that there are now to teach yourself no-code, low-code, AI. I mean, there was nothing like that. So it involved reaching out to techie people and asking them to share things that were usually way, way, way too techie for me, but reading and reading until I understood how to sell, in layman's terms, a highly technical proposition. So that's kind of how I got to where I am now with software, which then obviously became SaaS because it moved to the cloud. And now with the evolution of Gen AI, um, yeah, it's great. I love it. I love um, being able to keep ramping up my knowledge to stay ahead of the pack. Paint a picture of that. What are the common misconceptions for maybe any of our listeners that have watched a little bit too much Wolf of Wall Street, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, mm. or Jerry Maguire? Like, what's the reality of, of the B2B enterprise and, and software sales from your perspective? Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, well, funny because I joked um, that uh, it probably was a little Glen Gary, Glen Ross when I first joined Sales. You know, Sales was hard. Primarily, the reason it was harder then was because the psychology and the science behind Sales had not really come into force, and the learning um, opportunities and the learning collateral that we can all access by ourselves was not really de- um, developed. And secondly, it felt that like sales back in the day was a kind of con artist way of working that you talked, you know, this was kind of generated by the early concepts of door-to-door salesmen selling things that you really didn't need or didn't want, but by their sheer persistence and charm, they broke you down and you bought to get rid of them. And nothing, for me, I think the modern world of sales, and especially enterprise sales, there is nothing that could be near, you know, it's further from the truth. Um, It has evolved into what I consider to be a profession because people can make very serious money. At this, the difference between, say, what I do and then um, if your listeners have been, you know, if they've gone into a mobile phone shop and bought a phone or like a car, those are considered to be B to C, buyer to, so the seller is selling to a consumer. So it's buyer um, business to consumer sales, um, primarily that operates in the retail world. And... Then in the world that I inhibit, it's B2B, so where it's businesses selling to business. And even though across the globe, the vast majority of businesses 
are very small SMEs, what we call small, medium-sized enterprises. You know, they can sometimes just be a mom and pop shop. It might be family-led businesses. They usually have less than, sometimes can be just 10 people in an office, 50 to enterprise is when you get up to 10,000 employees, usually globally, with a turnover that is in the billions, certainly a um, hundred, certainly generated millions in turnover. And businesses that operate in that realm are usually listed on the stock exchange. There are very few that aren't. So they will, in the UK, that will be the FTSE. FTSE 100, which is the top 100 listed by performance. And then you'll have the, it goes up to FTSE 4 in the US, it's a NASDAQ. NASDAQ, um, there's lots of other uh, exchanges and bourses that uh, businesses can be listed on. And those are of interest because they, they have the scope and they have the budget to need to buy software, but also because of the sheer number of employees. Uh, most of that workforce is digitized in some way and they will need to have, you know, they'll need to have like a CRM, a customer relationship management platform where they'll put in their customers' details and a lot of other forms of technology that just speed up the day-to-day business as usual. And that's really what differentiates enterprise B2B from buying a mobile phone to selling maybe um, an accountancy package to a small group of solicitors. You talked about working in big organisations versus the startup scale-up world. How's your role different in, in, in those two different environments? It's massively different because a larger organization has probably been you know it will have grown to that size over time sometimes you know it may be 20 30 years or longer and like businesses that have worked in oracle for example another business called microfocus that's just merged with open text both of them started in the 70s when text started really being developed and they have you know at least 10,000 employees, if not more, they operate. How my role specifically differs is that, first of all, it's very defined. I'll come in and manage a global sales team. They are mostly all hired or I'll hire more people. There's already a way of working that, you know, is either producing results or it's not. Uh, In lots of instances, I've been brought in by a business to uh, transform the sales processes and sales operations to help you know introduce a sales methodology or a new way of working to ramp up uh, the sales and to develop new routes to markets and how that differs from startups is that in a startup and a scale-up business they are really pushing towards growth. They may still be trying to define what well, the absolute essence of any business is a what's known as product market fit. And that means that you have a product that has a fit in the marketplace. It actually is something that people will use and more importantly, they will buy. And if your product or your solution or your service does not have product market fit. My personal advice is run away. Um, Don't don't go to work there until, (laughs) or or work with the founders um, to help them engage with end users to pivot and find what what end users are looking for, end users being the customers. But that's absolutely critical. If you don't have something that people will pay for, you're going to go out of business. And it doesn't matter how popular it is. I mean, look at um, Twitter and IX. You know, for a long time, I was screaming at my my laptop, shot. why why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Because for me, they had so many revenue opportunities that they weren't leveraging. And of course, then it was, uh, you know, the board just got tired of giving them money. And it didn't matter how many users they were, but advertising, which is, usually how that works. You need to have other revenue streams as well because advertising is, you know, 
been impacted by various market forces. Yeah, I think great, great example talking about Twitter at the end, you know, got all this data, not monetizing much of it. How would you advise people who want to move into this industry? Okay, there's a couple of routes to market. I mean, what I would say is that good people are always in demand. I know at the moment, like I've a couple of founders have come to me and asked if I can help them or at least publicize roles for BDRs, business development reps that they have. And those are entry level roles into sales. I started off as a BDR, a sales development rep, SDR. The term is slightly interchangeable, but an SDR is a bit more advanced along the line. But there are the people who deal with incoming leads and then also follow campaigns to jet, to do outbound activity. So that can be sent in emails, which is automated at scale, but um, managing outbound email campaigns, engaging with prospects on LinkedIn or via social, uh, hosting webinars, just uh, ringing people. And, you know, despite the whole, oh, robots are going to take our jobs, the power of an outbound phone call cannot be underestimated. If you find the right person who has potential to buy your your product you know i just i think it's when people ring me up actually it doesn't happen very often now, but when it does i'm like yeah i'm all ears i want to hear what they've got to say and then i usually start trying to coach them as well mm. but i have tremendous it's a really heartless thankless task it's very hard to do i've done it you know i've done 100 calls a day back in the day i started as you know i started in the trenches and i think having that experience will make you a really really employ it's not easy and i think it's really it's kind of unfair that we make the people um who have the least experience do the hardest job (laughs) and one sometimes the most critical job to the business because getting business into you know getting sales in leads in is really important so what i would say is a yes there's a massive demand for good people if you are a graduate a I would advise everybody to get on LinkedIn and, you know, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll share my profile. I I think it's a brilliant, it's a business, it's, you know, kind of Facebook equivalent for business. Uh, It's a brilliant directory of salespeople, mostly salespeople um, globally. And I've now got nearly 7,000 contacts. Get on there, look for businesses who are hiring Look for talent acquisition managers who are hiring and other you can do a Google uh, LinkedIn search. Build your profile. Talk about what you've done in terms of business activities. You know, what have you done at university or what have you done in your free time? Your qualities that are the kind of qualities that businesses will be looking for. So having resilience, never giving up, being authentic, being easy to work with. Um, being proactive, being a team player, those are the qualities that employers want to look at. You know, actually, no matter what age you are or where you are in your career, they're critical qualities as far as I'm concerned. So talk about, the, you know, what what makes you someone that would somebody would want to have on your team? What, you know, and then examples of how to demonstrate, you know, those qualities. Do courses, you know, do get involved with you know if you're in team sports talk about that because team players are always valued if you have a hobby you know something that differentiates you from the crowd you know talk about all of those good things and reach out to people personally and ask them you know say i love i love what you do as a company i'd love to come and work for you etc but do your research as well so i mean that's how to get into sales always ask for feedback as well You know, if you actually get to the stage where you have an interview, ask for feedback afterwards, you know, send a follow-up email. And then follow up as well. You know, it's a simple thing where most people fall down. They don't follow up on what they've done. Yeah, that's great. I love so much, so much good advice in there. And I like how you're referencing all of those people qualities, right? The the human element and showcasing that, um, which fits nicely into my next question. You know, you you gave us such a nice overview earlier of all of the changes in technology that you've seen and how that's impacted sales. 
um, you referenced also, you know, maybe we do have a fear of robots taking over and now we're talking about the human element. So I'm curious your take more on how you see AI affecting this industry, um, if you already mm. have, where you see it going, and if you are using it in any way right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, this is one of my favorite top topics. And uh, yeah, I actually delivered a webinar as a intro to Gen AI within the sales process uh, earlier in the year. Um, you know, whether we like it or not, AI is in our lives. Um, you know, if we ring call center or we ring our insurance company to, you know, renew car insurance, et cetera, et cetera, there is usually those little call bots on websites or within the telephone system. A lot of that will be AI enabled now. And um, so, you know, I know a lot of my peers, a lot of older professionals are putting their heads in the sand and saying, oh, you know, oh, we, it's terrible. It's going to take my job. Ignore it. It will take your job. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't replicate jobs. It replicates functions. And I think as humans, we need to be very clear on what our USP is, our unique selling point. What is it about me that makes me able to be someone of interest to a hiring manager. I would say the fact that I'm absolutely passionate about finding new business. I'm a hunter at heart. I always will be, as opposed to a farmer. So a hunter is someone who goes out and hunts for the new and does cold outreach and knows where to look. A farmer is someone who, like an account executive, account manager, who manages the account when the business has been brought in. Um, and I'm a hunter and I always will be, and I, even though I'm a VP, vice president of sales level now, I will always be a hunter. And that's what, you know, those skills uh, will never go out of fashion. So it's about knowing what makes us unique to a hiring manager, but also ramping up and adopting AI. Uh, and within the world of sales, uh, I personally use, normally when I have a medium of something, I use a call transcription service called Glyphic. I know the founders are really smart guys. And that listens to the call. It does a summary. It can create a proposal out of the notes. It can create a follow-up email. It can feed into a, a CRM system, if I like. It does all of those great things. There's loads of those tools around at the moment. I also use a deal room, which is, there's some brilliant ones out there, uh, Aligned, Page, Trumpet, which is a British model, but though, um, Enable Us, which is one that I implemented in my last room, uh, last role. And what they do is they hold all of the collateral for a prospect, someone you're engaging with in the sales process. So if I reach out to someone and I set up an introductory meeting, I will spin up a deal room that's branded in their corporate colors or sometimes with their logo. And it'll have a transcript of the call. It'll have a case study that's relevant to their business. It'll have all of the information that they're interested in if they were to do business. And I mean, obviously, this takes a bit of effort to work. But most of them, these rooms are really simple to set up now. Um, your marketing team will have created the collateral. It'll be on hand, so they'll also have their proposals. The beauty of them is that prospect doesn't have to bother you to find out more uh, information. They can forward it on to colleagues. You can see when it's been forwarded, when it's been opened, when it's been read or more importantly, when it's not been read and the information hasn't been engaged with. So I think those are the absolute staples for me um, because I'm between roles at the moment. When I'm managing teams, I use a, a solution called Gong for call listening, which also has coaching involved in it. I use a tool called Perplexity for research at the moment because it uses verified and trusted sources Whereas as opposed to ChatGPT4, which I have a license for, it just crawls the web for information and you don't know where that information came from. You can't verify if it's 100% true. 
you know, AI does hallucinate, Gen AI does hallucinate, as we say, it spins up crazy, crazy theories and crazy stories that are not rooted in the truth. So you have to be very careful about what you find. But yeah, there's really amazing developments at the moment. I know uh, Claude, which is from Anthropology, I think, one of the contenders to ChatGPT and Google's Gemini. They just released some brilliant new releases at the start of the week, uh, which like just have amazing, uh, even more advanced capabilities. And it's just evolving all the time. So what for me, um, how I ramped up my knowledge was to identify thought leaders who are doing all the hard work of going out and crawling the web, who are maybe on the beta release of these providers to get word about the first releases. And they do the work of testing them, finding out what's applicable. And then I can judge, right, okay, is this of interest? Is it something I'm going to use? Um, you know, just getting off the topic a bit, but when people say to me, okay, so what AI should I implement? I go, no, no, no. The question you need to ask is, do I need another tool in my tech stack? And if so, what is the right tool? If it's AI enabled, great, but do not go out to buy a new shiny tool because it seems right or you hear your competitors using it. Always make sure that it there is a need and that it also is connected with the other tech that you deploy so that you know, you may have the sales team at the front of the customer journey using uh, an AI-enabled tool. Will that feed through to the customer success team who are actively managing that account over the period of a year, the point where they renew the license? I mean, all of those are critical considerations that you need to think about before you spend a lot of money so i could talk about this topic all day we are going to be going scouring the transcript for all those references and, and going back in those those and I guys, we'll, we'll, the try, same thing. we'll do our best to share all the links in yeah, in the description sure, yeah. the Functionality, but i really appreciate that you called out no let's be intentional do i need this tool what can it yeah. be used for i think that's a yeah. piece that people really need to think about, yeah. especially as they look at integrating it in their work. Sales has become highly technical. There's a vast array of tools that sales professionals now have to use to transcribe their calls, to do their research, to put their call notes or interact in any interaction with a prospect or client should be transcribed into the customer relationship management tool, the CRM. And if it's not, then those interactions are lost. And so now sales has become almost an admin-focused role when the actual only critical thing to a business is that sales professionals are on the phone, reaching out to prospects, dealing with customers, engaging and driving revenue and driving revenue opportunities. So I've seen teams really overwhelmed by tools and that's why I want to make sure that they, they work, they do what is needed before I implement them. But secondly, that they're joined up and they're easy to use for the you know the people doing the hard craft of sales. Sean, you talked a bit about leading teams, building teams, coaching teams, and, to, and a little bit about sort of the advice for job search process, but maybe dig a little bit into that a little bit more. If there are people applying for sales roles, what are some of the do's or don'ts of either writing your CV or resume or the application as a whole or the interview process? You touched upon some of those, but anything more you want to add there? I had great feedback from a recruiter very recently who said that my CV was very one of the very few sales-focused CVs he'd seen with actual numbers. So I, when I so I'll have an impact statement. So I delivered a thirty nine percent reduction um, increase in time to sale. So I reduced the sale cycle from say eleven months to seven months. I delivered X amount of revenue. I smashed my target by X amount percentage, and then the actual amount. I'll name check high-level clients that I've sold to. I've delivered a number of webinars. At one point when I worked in the legal profession, it was 2007, there was new legislation that came out around money laundering. 
and I delivered a CPD, a Continuous Professional Development Accredited Workshop on that to law professionals. So I'll mention that. Um, I've got the supporting collateral. If anyone wanted to see that, I have pay slips. Hang on, if depending on where you are in your journey, but if you have pay slips that show how much commission you've been uh, paid, or of course your P60, um, which is your in the UK is your tax statement at the end of the year. Keep those that you have actually done what you've said you've done. Uh, I put. I've I've actually done a lot of media, a lot of volunteering, help out in a lot of things because I just enjoy giving back, and I literally, you know, forgot about all of the things I've been involved in. And luckily, at the time, I've remembered to put them on LinkedIn. As there's, I can't remember, it's down near the bottom of projects I've worked in. So make sure, and especially, I will shout out to all of the women listening. Um, it's very easy to forget all of the extracurricular work that you do or the work, I mean, to anyone, the work that you do over and above your set job spec. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. Of course you should. But make sure that you keep a note of it because, A, it's really useful and when you go to look for another role. You're able to actually say, well, actually, I did all this and this and, you know, and I was really good at that and, I spun up this project because I could see a need and that's what employers are looking for. So talk about things that show that you're a fully developed human. And if you're not, <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I, I was a non-exec director for Dementia NI. I helped create a, uh, a co-produced a handbook for carers of people living with dementia. Um, you know, I've done that. And, you know, that's relevant. It, well, it shows that I can actually do things like that, you know. So do that. But focus, if you're going for a sales role, focus on the numbers. You know, what did you do to drive revenue? Um, what did what campaigns did you excel at? How did you impact or help shape the, you know, what you were working on? Those things are always of interest. And then keep it to two pages there's some brilliant tools out there. I mean, none that I've really used because mine, my CV is a living document that I've crafted over the years. But, you know, leverage some of the brilliant tools. Even actually I noticed on Microsoft, it has some brilliant templates. And then keep it short, keep it relevant, tailor it to each role. So not tell lies or fabricate, but keep the things that are relevant in for that role. And if they're not, then take them out because very few CVs really get read. They're all unfortunately scanned by usually AI-enabled applicant tracking systems. So you can do some research online to see what the buzzwords are. You know, look at that job spec very clearly and align your CV to that. Leverage the buzzwords the industry terms that they mention, if relevant. So, um, yeah. And you know what? I like. I always try and help people get a job. I've actually success, successfully helped a few people, ex-colleagues. So hit me up, get in touch. And, you know, I'm always happy to help if I can. Yeah, that's amazing. I should stress, we are not feeding our guests the <laughs> answers when we ask them about how to write their resumes, um, but they are violently agreeing with the advice that you can find uh, on our website, in our guides, and in, in our templates. Oh, right. So, oh, that's good to know. Yeah, so, so yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, great. So, uh, yeah, numbers, I think, is a big one. I mean, sales should be the easy one, right? Like, if you can't talk yeah. about, you know, big pound, dollar, euro signs, about revenue bringing in, the commission, yeah, uh, I think that's that's the place to do it. Yeah. yeah great advice. Yeah, but just be very clear. I mean, then probably leading on from that, if I may, um, just in terms of interview prep, this this is the killer, you know. Um, and you know, nerves can really get the best, uh, the better of you. What I would absolutely stress is do your interview prep. Um, do your re you know? There's so many free tools, and the first and best free tool is the company website. Um, go on it. Look at who. It sounds really basic, but I've read some horror stories, and I've also met like some bloody horror stories when I've been interviewed yeah. of people who didn't have their camera on, people who one guy who was interviewing for a job at 
100k basic, was on the back of a jeep in Thailand on his way to the beach. Didn't want to have his car. I'm like, okay, I think my work is done here. But yeah, show respect because the way you behave in an interview is probably how you're going to behave with a client. And so I want to make sure that A, you turn up in time, you're dressed appropriately, that you're prepared, look at the company website, be sure that you understand what they do, um, who their clients are, be able to say, oh, I worked with that client, or actually I work with other clients in that space, which may be of interest, of course. Research their competition, uh, look at case studies, you know, what webinars have they got coming up? I, I also sign up to their newsletters, which is interesting because then sometimes the newsletter doesn't come through and that also tells its own story. I would say be careful of where you go to work as well. If you want to work with good people who you will learn from in a supportive environment and not a toxic environment. I love these points you're sharing because not only if you are actively interviewing, does it help you prepare but you're also interviewing the company, right? In that process and all of this advice and all these stories you're sharing are a great reminder of that, right? If we are supposed to be in charge of something and it's not working or we look at the company website and we can't find it or we see someone who would be our colleague, right? Like posting something that we don't think is a good practice, right? These are all signs we need to take advantage of to know maybe this isn't the place for me and remember that interviewing is that two-way street always, um, which yeah. we can forget when we're active in a job search or when we're younger in our career, we feel that we just need to take anything, but that is never usually works out. Um, so it's always no, good to keep no. that in mind. <laughs> you know, yeah. go with your gut instinct on that because you're prepared, you know what you're looking for, you know those green flags and you know the red flags. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then obviously um, have good questions ready for for the recruiter and be sure that you understand what the day-to-day role is and if you don't ask those questions actually a key question at the moment I would say is ask are they considering internal candidates understand why you would be a better hire than the internal candidate can you tell us about something that you have learned from experience uh, maybe something you would do differently the next time or just what you've learned over your career. Any interesting stories there? Yeah, yeah. I would probably say trust your gut feeling on on roles. And also, yeah, if something's too good to be true, it never is. I mean, just <laughs> that's a maxim for life, you know. From the very first instance of starting to look for a role, I look at a job spec. I mean, nowadays, because it's kind of timely, uh, this is Women's History Month and Friday is International Women's Day. Timely reminder that the way a job spec is written, I will tell you a lot about that job, that organization. And there are ways where you can write a job spec to make it much more inclusive, uh, to invite a lot more candidates, because it's been proved that men will apply for roles if they think they can do it whereas women if they don't have I think if they don't have 60 of the requirements or more they won't apply so job specs in progressive organizations have been written in a way that says even if you think you can do it you know get in touch because we want to be inclusive in our hiring and those are the kind of organizations that I personally want to work at so that's the first thing I look at how the job description is written. Yeah, is this the right place for me? Because I know my values, I know what I stand for and what I really don't want to tolerate in organizations. So organizations, and you know, there's so many tools now, like a glass door or whatever, where you know where they don't treat people properly. Or I mean, for me, I think it's about doing your research to make sure you want to be in that organization. Uh, and you, you know what? I've also reached out to people to say, "Hey, what's it like to work there on LinkedIn?" You know, and usually people are very positive. So yeah, um, for me, what probably going to a role where people said, "Actually, don't go there." You know, uh, we've heard it's bad, and I've kind of been tempted by the money and the and the title and the prestige. You know, or being promised something 
where they've said, oh, actually, somebody's not doing their job, so we want to hire you and push them sideways or get rid of them. My very first question would be, have you told them they're not doing their job? Usually they haven't. And also, you know, if you don't feel that the salary um, is right for that level of role, ask what, you know, ask for more, negotiate. So, so you've talked a lot about values there. Um, what's your advice for balancing work and other things in, in people's lives? Uh, yeah, man, I can become a workaholic, you know, and very much to my detriment and get very, very stressed and obsessed with jobs. And I think um, because I've had a bit of time out over the last few months, I've become, well, first of all, that time out's given me a chance to get my health back. I need to start exercising much more. To um, I joined a walking group. I've got loads of hobbies, so I've got much more involved in those. Just pushed to the side. And I was at a very interesting talk with female leaders, a female leadership panel a couple of weeks ago at Figma's office. And this really brilliant Irish woman said, I was at a retreat with female leaders recently and all of us had agreed we had done probably 30% more work in our careers than we needed to. Or, and if we hadn't have done whatever the, the various bits of 30% or the extra work was we'd have probably still been in the same place as we are now. It, it didn't positively impact us, but the thing is that it does negatively impact you. So I think the, the very first secret of work um, being absolutely miserly with your time. So for me, how I manage that is if people put a meeting in my diary, ask where the agenda is, what's the outcome that we want to achieve from that meeting and making sure that that agenda is kept to and that outcome is delivered not having meetings for meetings sick first of all and then just being very clear right okay what have I got to achieve in this job and is it actually feasible and then sticking to that and not I'm not saying don't do more than you should but I think women especially are very guilty of doing more than we should for any positive benefits, you know. So, but I mean, I would just say to everyone, be very careful about where you spend your time and make, you know, if you don't have a hobby or a sport or something you love, find something very quickly for your mental health because it's yeah. so, you know, the workplace is very stressful. Um, so turn your, turn your laptop off as well. After all the great advice you have been sharing with us today and with our listeners, I'm curious if there's any more best and or worst advice you have ever received that you would like to share with us. Yeah, um, <laughs> a good lesson I learned very a very long time ago was I got this from my one well, of my best friends, Caroline, who I started with at ITV um, Granada TV uh, a long time ago, and when we were both hired to do the same job or the same type of role. And so there was a five grand bonus if you got to the end of your probation period. And after a few months, I said something about, oh, the five grand bonus. And she went, oh, I, I got that at the start. You know, what? How? I said, well, I just told them, sure, <laughs> if you don't like me, you'll just get rid of me. So just assume that I'm going to be staying and you'll like me. And, you know, I would like that five grand now. And the lesson of that was, if you don't ask, you don't get. And always, always negotiating salary. And the other thing I would say, especially as a woman, is I see lots of mediocre men doing the same job as me, paying probably more. Maybe not so much now, because I think the world is a lot more transparent and we're all incredibly networked, so work gets out. But... You know, the sad fact of life is that there are lots of people who got their jobs through people that they played rugby with or football or friends or friends of friends or daddies, connections, whatever. Uh, maybe more in the UK, but there are lots of people who are in roles that are very well paid and they're not delivering. And I know I can deliver. So I, I know my worth. I do my research and um, yeah. I am ambitious, you know, and 
you know, you may as well pay me, I'll get the job done. <laughs> so that's probably the best piece of advice I can yeah. give you. And then I would say absolutely critically, and I got this piece of advice from my brother, who was in a very stressful job, look after your mental health. You know, I'm, I'm incredibly resilient and I'm a really strong person, but that's also got me into situations where I went to work, especially in one environment that was quite toxic. And I kind of thought, oh yeah, I'm, like, I'm, I'm tough. I know how to handle this. And to be honest, it had much more of an impact on me than I realized because, you know, I just wasn't looking after myself and that's really not good. So, and I think, you know, especially for younger people coming up the ranks who are digital natives and are born like on social media, social media, I limit my usage and I can do that. But for those that have kind of been born in that age, it's very hard. So. You know, don't believe all the stuff you see on even LinkedIn. You know, people only share really the positive stories. Believe that you are good enough and look after your mental health. Thanks. That's great, um, Sean. So we're going to wrap with our final one or two questions. So for our listeners, can you give a book, a book and or podcast recommendation? Book, yeah. Uh, Clear Thinking, which came out at the start of the, the year. And apologies, I've forgotten the name of the author, James Clears Habits, which is an email. And James Clears also the guy that wrote the kind of definitive book on habits. And I think it's learning, the getting the, the uh, habits, good habits as a basic is really, really important to being able to actually be focused and achieve what you want to, you've set out to do in your personal life and in your uh, professional life uh podcast um i've just been on the what makes you tech podcast so i'm going to recommend that that's great yeah any links you share with us remind us we'll share them after so our, our listeners can can listen to them as well um as we wrap up is there anything you would like to pitch us um, you've referenced a lot of great things you've already done in your career so we'll give you that space if there's anything else you want to pitch right now well, I would say connect with me on LinkedIn. That's kind of, I'm on that a lot. <laughs> when I said I wasn't addicted to social media, I'm like, okay, I'm maybe slightly addicted to LinkedIn. Because you know what? I've got great job offers and lots of other things via LinkedIn. But uh, yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm actually in planning stages of creating a workshop on leveraging Gen AI in the sales process. I've been talking to business about that last night so you know i'd love to share that with viewers whenever um, that comes that goes live and yeah just hit me up i'm also in the market for a sales lead role so speak to me fantastic thanks siobhan a uh, great way to wrap things off uh and i think you know once you've got that gen i project up, up and running uh we'd love to have you back on and hear all the great results that i'm sure will be coming from that um Excellent. But yeah, once again, thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, yeah, look forward to, to sharing uh, links with everyone uh, very, very soon. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Lisa. It's been yeah, a pleasure. Yeah, thanks. So another episode in the can, Lisa. What are your reflections on our conversation with Siobhan? I really liked her talking about sales shifting and to a slightly more technical role and really being able to balance those technical aspects with human aspects and sort of if you're thinking of a career in sales, thinking of both of those things uh, and seeing how sales has really shifted over time in turn and how it differ based on different company size as well. So I think she really, her career has spanned all of it. And I loved the insight she shared. Uh, the personal insights I liked, I think she shared a lot about being authentic, finding balance, but also knowing your worth and being able to pitch that. And I think that's great for all of us in our career, but especially as we're starting our careers to be able to get in the habit of negotiating and pitching what we know we can bring to a job from the very beginning. I think it's a, it's a skill a lot of us never get, but certainly a lot of us never do at the beginning. So, you know, use her as encouragement to start doing that from your very first job. 
Um, what about you? Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that, that, that a sales leader would be strong on negotiation. So I don't think we expect to do anything less uh, from someone. Yeah, I think she put a burst of bubble of maybe the popular perception of sales of these very ruthless, you know, we referenced Glenn Glauco and Ross, that very sort of hard, old school, sort of very grinding things out kind of tough guy kind of uh, approach to, to sales. Whereas I think the reality is now it's, it's much more... Uh, consultative, as, as I think Siobhan um, started to touch on, and thinking about the customer and their needs and how your product is going to solve those. Um, and incredibly inspiring to hear her talk about the values um, that she holds, um, all of the extracurricular things that she's doing, really inspiring about, about those different um, good causes. So I guess the news flash is salespeople have morals and values <laughs> and, uh, and are humans too. Um, so yeah, and, and I think you, you, you know, you can be a, a moral or ethical person and still have a really successful in a sales environment and, you know, hold on to your values and that sort of stuff. So yeah. I think a uh, you know, really encouraging message from Siobhan. I agree. All right, everyone. Well, we've made it to the end of the podcast which we hope means you found it interesting, entertaining, and possibly even valuable. I know you did. So if so, let's subscribe, right? Subscribe on Spotify, YouTube, and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Even better, if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want. Hang on, let's see if we do it. Can I, you want. <laughs> uh, visit Career Badger for a bunch of free resources we mentioned at the top of the show. Or even better, download the app and get live, real human coaching from our resident career coach, Lisa. That's it from us. See you next time.